Hey there, welcome to the stream. Welcome to uh, welcome to the podcast studio. I'm using a different lens today. Uh, this is the lens that I also use for uh, the mass that I stream on on Sunday. Uh, it it's not as good as the one that I used uh, last time, but it has the advantage of I can put the camera much closer to my face, so it's 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 more practical. Less cables in the room. Mm. Taking a cup of coffee while people are joining the chat. If you're watching this after uh, this aired, um, maybe a good reason to subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't done so already. And if you miss the notification that I'm live, uh, there's this bell icon, and I think that helps. It, it's not a guarantee that you'll always get a uh, notification when I go live, but um, it is uh, it, it, it heightens your chances, especially if you're subscribed to a, a whole lot of YouTube channels like I am. I don't always get notifi notified. Um, and then, of course, if you're following uh, me through other social media, then this may also be uh, a way to, to get notified uh, if you're not on YouTube. Hey, Marco. Hey, SL7. Welcome. It's a, a bit of an impromptu stream. Um, usually, I, I like to uh, announce in advance when I go live, but uh, these days are still a little bit unstructured. So um, I'll just go live and see who passes by. Hmm. By the way, welcome if you are a new visitor uh, and uh, maybe a new subscriber to the to the YouTube channel. I get a number of people who, uh, through the algorithm, discover my videos and then they subscribe. So in case you're wondering what I'm doing here, I'm about to record um, my weekly podcast, which you can find over at fatherroderick.com or just by looking for Father Roderick in your podcasting software. And I've been doing this since... Bah, 2005, I think. I'm a, I'm a dinosaur when it comes to podcasting. Hey, Mary. Also making coffee. Very good. Steven is there, too. Mm. Good to see you all. So for this stream, I'm using um, my little uh, iMac, or MacBook, I should say. Um, and I'm using Mac software. I'm using Ecamm software when I'm streaming... Um, for instance, downstairs or when I'm streaming Lego, which hopefully I'll be able to resume soon, I use uh, Windows software. So it, that Windows software enables me to stream, um, in addition to streaming to YouTube, it uh, can also stream to Facebook. So the other day I was doing a, uh, a gaming stream, which I also sometimes do here on YouTube. Um, and that's not really for, you know, content or anything. It's just I like to hang out. I like to play video games, and it's fun to chat while I'm doing that. So it's not a gamer's channel, uh, by all means. Uh, I'm not much of a gamer, at least not of a not much of a good gamer. So, uh, but it is another occasion to just connect with you. And so I was streaming that to Facebook, and for whatever reason, uh, the Facebook stream just kept interrupting and uh, and I noticed that that was not the case on YouTube so I don't know if that was my computer or maybe the streaming software that I was using but um, the advantage with Ecamm is it goes straight to YouTube and it's proven to be very reliable very versatile hey room room Kaj from Poland now I have no idea how to pronounce that in in Polish room Kaj I'm just guessing <laughs> sl7 is there too marco says it's dark in the studio yeah i've got the windows closed the sun is shining outside in fact but i always close the windows because i've got more control over the over the lighting conditions here and probably while i'm doing my show uh, the sun will go down and it will get very dark so if i rely too much on daylight um everything gets out of whack so i'm i'm um Maybe I can show you by turning my laptop. I'm well, maybe not. Can I do that? Because I've got a, a separate camera, uh, <laughs> but it's hooked up to all sorts of. No, I can't turn turn this around because it will it will disconnect. But I've I've got a lot a lot, uh, uh, a lot of wires running into the into the MacBook. Otherwise, I could turn it around to use the webcam to show you the lighting situation here. But you'll just have to take my word for it. There are two lights here. Um, and there's a light behind me, which you can you can, you can see that a little bit. Um, if, I move, if I move backwards a little bit, you see this reflection here. 
So that's coming from uh, a what, what we call a rim light. So it's a spot high up on a pole and it shines down on me. Um, it's it's not the best light to do this with, but it it what it helps you separate from the background a tiny little bit. And then there's a lamp behind me, right behind me, which you can't see either, but you can see the reflection on the curtain. So it gives a little bit more depth. It's all you know. I'm still trying to figure out how to get a, a professional look. Um, and the only thing that I still on my wish list is um, well, actually two things. One is a better camera because. Uh, the, these these Canon M50s are, you know, they're they they do what they should do, but they are already um, uh, getting a little bit old <laughs> in a certain way, and and better lens, a better lens. I'd like to have a, a wide angle lens that is much faster than this one. This is the kit lens that I'm currently using. So the faster a lens, the more lights light it is able to process, the more you can get blurry backgrounds, and it just gives more definition to the overall image. But those lenses are expensive. So we're talking like 400 to 600 bucks for just the lens, right? It's not the entire the entire uh, camera. So I'm just building it up gradually. I'd rather be a bad gamer that plays good games than a good player that plays bad games. That's a, that's a good one. <laughs> I'm going to remember that. <laughs> Rosalie, good to see you. It's been a while. How are you doing? And Stephen is in California where the sun is just coming up. And I think, did I hear on the news that also the new Omicron variant is coming up there? Like the first case was, was that in California or was it in Florida? I don't know. Ah, coffee's already getting cold. Blech. This is still, don't tell anyone, especially not my Italian friends. This is instant coffee it's disgusting it's really disgusting but it's easy to prepare i don't have a coffee machine yet so i'm kind of surviving on on uh, on instant coffee since since my move basically since april Ugh. and i haven't been to rome in the meantime so yeah it's not going well <laughs> Jeremy, how is Indiana? Good to see you. Hey, Michiel. Starnios from the UK. Well, he's actually from the Netherlands, but now in the UK. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm following you on, um, on Twitch. I see that you do a lot of uh, Star Wars, uh, The Old Republic, which is one of those games that I want to go get back into because it's, it's so much fun to, to play an RPG MMO. Or MMORPG in in uh, in the Star Wars universe. Stiegbeck is there too. And the Rhine. Are you completely caught up with the Wheel of Time show? And how are you liking the adaptation? I'll be talking about that in in the show that I'm about to record in a podcast. I have I have opinions. Uh, so I'm current with the show. I'm just not current with my commentary um, because life is busy, still very busy, and stuff ha keeps happening. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but it's a great show. Alexander, good to see you. Also from Poland. Dobry wieczór. Uh, an SL7. French vanilla creamer helps for instant coffee. Oh, really? I, I'm not keen on all the extra um, sweeteners and, and, and flavors. Um the best, the best thing for me is to make sure I get a, a, a decent coffee device. Uh, but I don't want to get one of those big ones. You've got these uh, coffee machines uh, that require just a lot of cleaning, a lot of maintenance. And I just don't, I don't want to spend the time. I do have the time, maybe. I could make time for it. But it's, you know, I like coffee, but not to that degree. Um, and Kai, Kel, no, is it? What is it? Kai? This is a very tiny laptop, <laughs> and these letters are small. I think it's Guy Bowers from Germany. Guten, guten Tag und herzlich willkommen. Dobrivietschu. All righty. Well, if it's okay with you, I'm going to record my show, and then we can we can chat. You can also chat during during the uh, recording of the podcast uh, if you want. I, I'm wondering. Yeah, you may be right that the, the studio looks a little bit 
dark, on the dark. It looks on the dark side. <laughs> but I do have a little bit of light there. Let me know if this is too too somber. I can I can up the uh, what is it the um, the ISO of the camera a little bit. Um, on the other hand, I do seem to if I look at on the preview window here on my laptop, it, it looks okay. Margot says I would strongly recommend a French press. Oh, really? I, I've used a French press in the past, but it, I just thought it was it, it was a lot of grit in my coffee when I used that. Have you started Foundation? Yes, yes, yes. I've watched two episodes now, and it's it's great. But it requires a lot of concentration. These are long episodes. Um, and I don't know anything about the backstory, but it was surprisingly um, accessible. I expected something a little bit more highbrow, because it's really hardcore science fiction. Steak Bake from Edinburgh. Very nice. I've been there years ago. Always want to go back. Looks intimate. Oh, good. Well, looks cozy. Th that's that's what I was aiming for. I, I wanted to have a cozy look, you know, a bit of uh, some stuff in the background. You see a um, little Star Wars here. <laughs> Just peeking around the corner. There's not much Star Wars here. There's a, a dragon sleeping in, on this... Uh, a shelf, and then I've got some, you know, like a treasure chest here with uh, some gold. Uh, it's very simple. It's not really very elaborate as decoration. Will improve over time. With a coarse grind and well-fitting plung plunger, it usually works well. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. I remember I've used it in the past, and it I, I never was a fan of it for some reason. I also don't really like the coffee coming from those little metal things. You know, these percolators you have to put on the fire. Uh, I, I kind of like my coffee with a bit of a cream uh, on it, you know, for a high-pressure coffee. Um, and there are machines that actually do it all automatically. I just have to find a good deal and something that is not too, too hard to, to, uh, to clean. Yeah, we need more science fiction. Well, we get Boba Fett soon, so that's that's something. Uh, but we need more uh, Star Wars role playing games. I mean, as much as I, I was uh, I was enjoying playing uh, Star Wars: The Old Republic, it it the engine is is very old. It's like uh, Lord of the Rings Online. It's it's nice for what it is, but it can't compete with what computers can do nowadays. And so I I just wish there was an easy way to kind of upgrade it and. The Star Trek, the Star Trek Online game is even worse. Um, I, that was a, a really great game, um, but the just so I don't know clunky as a, as a uh, as an engine, and especially if you go to a planet, it's so disappointing. All these character move, move these characters move like robots, and yeah. Percolated coffee is gross. Yeah, some people love it. I'm not a fan. I do enjoy Star Trek. Oh yes, um, I'm very frustrated that uh, Star Trek Discovery season four is not accessible to us here in the Netherlands. So they 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 took it off Netflix. Probably botched um, negotiations. The negotiations will be short, um, <laughs> but uh, but it's a pity. And then they put it on this. Um, uh, I think it's a what was it called? Um, Flash TV? No, something like that. Like an online service, but it, apparently they only air it once, so you can't see it on demand. It is rubbish. Anyway. Uh, the Old Republic has an re expansion coming. Uh, okay. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the Knights of the Old Republic remake. I still don't know if it's going to be a re like a re like a, a real remake or if they will do it the way they do it with GTA now. Uh, where it's just kind of polishing up the graphics, but the rest is the same. I hope they're going to do like a total remake, like what they did with uh, um, Final Fantasy VII, something like that. Yeah, I could also get a metal coffee filter. Yeah, something like that. You know what? I'll once I get settled. Coffee is right now, even though it's it's a, a very pri primal. I say that primal need. <laughs> it's it's uh, it's not the thing that I'm most concerned with right now. There are still so many other things. Um, just slowly, gradually 
settling in the house and making sure that my, my rooms are, you know, more or less what they should be. It's still a ton of work. But I will talk about that more in my show, which I'm about to begin. Just want to say hi to Nate Dog 212 It's been a while since we talked on live streams. Yes, that's true. GTA was disappointing, although I have to say that with the latest patch, I've only played it through... Um, what is it, Xbox Ultimate Pass. So you, you actually, you're, I'm playing remotely. I do have a, an Xbox here in the room. Sorry, that was my Google device thinking I was talking to it. That happens a lot when I'm, when I'm in downstairs. I have one Echo and it, uh, it's uh, reacting to computer. Um, and that's a problem when I watch Star Trek because it, it, uh, it tries to help multiple times during each episode of Star Trek. <laughs> Anyway, um, so I do have an Xbox here in the studio. Um, so I'm, I'm tr still trying to figure out if I can do like live gaming here from this desk so that the desk would be the little insert. And then I have a TV uh, on that side, so behind you basically. And it's, it's on a swivel, so I can turn it towards me. <clears throat> so now what, what I need to find out is how to connect the image coming from my gaming consoles because I also got a switch there how I can somehow mix that with the image that I'm currently streaming. And one of the biggest issues right now is that this laptop is nine years old, maybe older. Um, and, and so it doesn't do multiple video sources. It, it just can't handle it. Um, so unless I replace this, which um, I'm not sure I can do that right now because we're there's just so much so much else that <laughs> is costing a lot. Um, I I th I think I'll have to uh, wait with the gaming, the you know the streaming. Um, well, anyway, let's start the show because otherwise um, it'll get dark and the day will soon be over. Hey, Star Dobrivietur, and welcome to the stream as well. I'm always happy to see so many people from Poland chiming in. Uh, I need to go to Poland, right? I need to do a documentary there. Maybe do like a documentary about the Witcher or about the mythology of the Witcher, something like that. Hmm. Let me know if you have any ideas. <clears throat> let's uh, let's begin, and we'll. Oh, wait a minute! I may have to uh, put the show notes in front of me because I do know how to chat, but. I also want to make sure I have something to talk about. It's week 48, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Lots of interesting topics, hopefully. Well, interesting to me. Hey, John. How's life in New York? Gosh, I miss, I miss that place. Uh, and Nate, uh, from California. It's always nice to have such a, a broad audience. Um, and I'm sure that people will uh, continue to uh, to join. By the way, if you have nothing to do, give this video a, a thumbs up. Um, that always helps the algorithm. Uh, all right, let's go. Hello, world! <laughs> Welcome to another show. I'm Father Roderick, podcasting from uh, this little tiny country in Europe the Netherlands, but uh, reaching out to all of you wherever you are. And today we've got a nice show, so sit back, relax, and enjoy. And the fact that I am able to do this show and all my other work is thanks to my supporters on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Father Roderick is the place where a community of fans help me to continue my mission and to also broaden it. Plus, they form a community. It's a literal community. You get access to a Discord server where we meet, where we exchange ideas and recipes and talk about, you know, TV episodes and complain about Star Trek. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great place to hang out. And, uh, and I always record a, an extra show for my um, patrons as a thank you, which is called Father Roderick to the Max. More about that show later on in this episode. But uh, you can always take a look at... Um, uh, patreon.com slash Father Roderick. And thank you if you are supporting me in whatever form. I always appreciate the fact that I'm not doing this just by myself. Do you know what's going on? Mm -hmm. 
This is what's happening in your world. Face it, Catholics rule. We got Boston, South America, the good part of Ireland, and we're making serious inroads in Mozambique, baby. You've taken your first step into a larger world. I didn't know you could actually sleep at Ikea. <laughs> Since I've been renovating this house, I've been to Ikea multiple times, even though it is still very restricted what we can do with the pandemic and all the precautions right now. So you have to keep your distance. And it, for a long time, Ikea was closed and you could only uh, order online and then you had to pick it up there. And then when, once they opened, it was still very restricted and... Um, and only a certain amount of people could uh, could enter the store. But now that I've finally moved into the new rectory, uh, I've been going quite a few times to the nearest IKEA. Actually, there are two IKEAs: the one that I used to go to in Amersfoort, and then a tiny little bit closer, but not doesn't really not much of a difference uh, near Arnhem. Uh, there's another IKEA, uh, and I, I just go there to get the to get anything that is currently lacking uh when i when i packed my stuff to, for the move i also threw away a lot of stuff that was just too old um for instance my plates most of the plates that i had were broken uh or just chipped and whatnot but you know it's just something you don't read i live alone so i i, I did, don't have that many guests normally over for dinner so you just keep using it but since i moved i was like okay let's throw it away it's it's you know these things are 15 years old um so i go to ikea for that also for the for the lights you know i got a lot of uh, rooms here to light properly even this studio where i'm recording this needed uh like spotlights in the ceiling and and i like everything to be automated so i can uh, give commands to um to my hub to my google home um, and, and it makes it very easy to quickly switch from one uh, lighting setup to another. So, for, for instance, here in the studio right now, everything is in podcast mode. But then I have, because all these IKEA lights are also pro programmable, or how do you say that, remotely, um, <clears throat> you, you can, you can uh, give them remote commands. I can always also program like a mass mode, because just on Saturday... I built a new set here in in this studio where I'm currently sitting. Uh, this is kind of the largest room on the first floor, uh, on the upper floor of the house. I, I created a small altar um, because ideally, of course, I'd like to resume uh, streaming mass in the, in, in the church here next door. But I'm so new here. I don't know the people here yet. They don't know about my plans. We still have to kind of talk and see if that is possible. And even if it is, if they allow me to do that in the future i still need to find the volunteers and the people that help me technically it's a it's a very different ball game streaming from a real church with with people present uh, instead of just doing this home set so i built this here but then i can program the lights all the lights in this room um to you know to change to a totally different mood and color once i turn the camera around and i stream mass so but anyway uh, lots of visits to Ikea, but I never thought you could sleep at Ikea's, and that is exactly what happened in Denmark the other day when lots of customers were at Ikea's, and usually these stores are open until, I don't know, 9 o'clock in the evening, <clears throat> and it's, it's usually quite busy in the evenings because people go to Ikea's not just for shopping, but also to eat. They've got a very good restaurant. It's super cheap. It's one of the ways in which they, of course, lure people in, because they're, I think they're actually operating their restaurant at a loss. That's how cheap they make it. But it gives, it's still marketing, you know, gives you the idea like, oh my gosh, it's such a bargain. And so it, it puts you in a state of mind where you easily uh, buy stuff while you're there to eat. And since IKEA in their store has a monopoly on everything they sell, there are no other brands. You can't, it's hard to compare. You know, I, for instance, I got a, go to Ikea's uh, one of these days and get myself a new couch. So down the stairs, I do have uh, two like bigger chairs. But since I've got a big living room, I'd like to be able to receive uh, uh, groups of people in the future. For instance, I don't know, if I join the 501st and we have Star Wars, uh, uh, you know, armor building sessions or what, I'd, I'd like to have place for, you know, eight people. 
so they can we can chat, we can uh, eat together. The room is big enough, but I don't have a couch, and I don't want to put like individual chairs. It's going to be very messy. So I go to I- to IKEA just to compare couches and basically just testing them out. That's one of the advantages. You can just sit there and f- see how it feels. And it's funny that so I'm I'm a bit of a hobbit. I'm not very tall. Uh, a lot of the couches that they sell at IKEA are made for modern day Dutch people and they're tall they're so tall even Father Henry is like I don't know like 30 centimeters taller than I am Um, and so are most of the people that live here and I noticed that because I was trying out these couches and in the catalog they looked beautiful and even in the they have these mock-up living rooms upstairs Um, and they look fantastic and then I sit in them and my legs are too short so like Ah, I need at least three pillows in my back to be able to sit in this couch. Um, and, and then I finally found a couch that was really nice to sit in. But then you have to uh, order individual pieces and kind of put it together. You can make different configurations. The thing is, they give you a price. And I cannot compare it to anything because there is no competition in that store. So, And that is kind of how they do their marketing. They first put you in this mindset like everything is cheap here because we've got so the, the food is so cheap and you've got these discounted items that cost almost nothing. And that is where, you know, you fill your basket and everything. And then once you get to the expensive stuff, that is where they have, of course, their big profit margin like beds and big furniture, kitchens. I bought my kitchen at Ikea. I have no idea if, if it was a good price or not. It was just convenient. I could see it in that store and I was like oh I like that and then they have this service where they will create your kitchen it 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 feels like oh Ikea these guys are my friends my friends they're helping me to create my kitchen but of course they're just cramming in as much Ikea stuff as possible and then they they bill you for it so but you can't compare it that's how it works so anyway all these people in Denmark were at Ikea's when outside a big snowstorm started and apparently the weather was so bad that people couldn't go back home again. All the rock, all the roads were blocked with snow and it was cold and it was dangerous on the road. And so the, the head of, of I, that, that particular Ikea store decided to allow the people in the store to stay the night over. And they could just sleep in the beds in the store. <laughs> And you've got all these these photos of people, actually an older couple, lying in one of these demo beds, you know, nice and cozy. And then in the morning they serve the breakfast, and in the evening they had soup. And it's just like a like a, a um, uh, what is it a p- pajama party over at IKEA's. And of course people loved it, and their marketing department loved it even more. So you see, the, the, uh, it's it's just one of those great examples where where, uh, you know, reacting quickly to at what seems to be a very, you know, difficult situation and, and, you know, what if people would have tried to get home from Ikea and they would have get stuck in the snowstorm or people could have gotten into accidents. That would have been very bad publicity, whereas now this is like a massive free advertisement campaign for Ikea. Now, I did uh, applaud the journalist that actually interviewed the people that stayed over and actually said, yeah, it looks nice that we're sleeping in these IKEA beds. But the thing is, in these stores, all the lights are automated. They're run, and run from computers. And nobody there in the store, not, none of the people that work there, were able to shut the lights off. So we've been sleeping there with all these bright lights shining on us. <laughs> We didn't sleep at all. <laughs> so anyway, I sometimes go, you know, I try out the, I, when I got my new mattress, I also uh, slept in, well, I didn't sleep, but I was laying down on one of those beds. And that's another, uh, that's the final warning I'm going to give you. If you ever go to Ikea's and you want to buy it like a couch or a chair or a bed, uh, always realize that you're probably already tired. Because you, you made the journey to Ikea, as you went up the stairs, you were run, running through that maze that they have on the first floor. And, and then you finally get to these chairs or this bed. So, of course, if you sit down, you're like, oh, this is so comfortable. This is so nice. 
but probably any chair, any bed, any couch would feel super nice and comfortable after, you know, having been walking around for hours. So beware of that. The, the experience at home may not be the same. Anyway, I'm really, really hoping to, to show you the house. Um, we're in the, the final stages. Uh, this upcoming Monday, we're going to do a few more last things, like tiny details. And, and then for the people that follow me on, um, on Patreon, I'll, I'll probably do like a video tour, like I did way back. You know, this ages ago when I first got to see the, the, the house and I got the keys for the first day. Um, and the difference is, is huge. Um, it's, a, it's a different house, actually. Um, I'm not going to, probably not going to put this online publicly uh, because, well, because of something I will tell you in the next segment, uh, which I should now begin. How do you not like movies? They're predictable. Like, the guy gets the girl and that kid sees dead people and Darth Vader is Luke's father. Not liking movies is like not liking puppies. They're fine. I just get bored and never make it to the end. You know, you need a movie education. You need a movication. Now I'm going to give it to you. So the movie segment starts with a little story. The other day, this is, uh, when was it? Last Saturday, I think? Yeah, last Saturday. I was hoping to finally go see the new Ghostbusters movie, and I had been looking forward to finding some time. I've been working really hard uh, these past few weeks with the final TV work, uh, lots of meetings, lots of other stuff. The renovation, of course, uh, takes a few days every week. Um, but I carved myself, I, I carved out a little bit of time to go watch the new Ghostbusters movie. And I ordered my ticket, and I was about to step on my bike when I hear this weird sound down the stairs, and I'd already been hearing sounds uh, of, you know, just noise down the stairs, but my rectory is next to um, the parish uh, rooms or the, the parish spaces. So there is an adjacent um, room that they use for coffee, and there are always people you know, sitting there or there could be choir rehearsals and, and whatnot. And there was also actually um, a funeral going on in the church. Um, and I'm not the, uh, a regular pastor here, so I was not uh, involved in that funeral. But I thought, well, maybe they are um, arranging the tables down the stairs in that uh, adjacent room for, you know, to drink some coffee with the volunteers or with the family after the funeral is done. I don't know. Uh, because it, there's been noise uh, there every once in a while. So I really was hearing that noise. but And it was loud. I was like, wow, I, what are they doing downstairs? But then I, when I went, went down to, to go to my bike to go to the movie theater, I heard that someone is actually trying to get into my main room, the, the living room. There is a door that leads to the, to the garden. And I had the, the curtains were still closed. This is because the, the, the windows uh, in this house have been installed in the 90s of the previous century. Um, and even though it's double glass, it is not very good. It's, um, so there's a lot of cold coming from those windows. So usually during the day, especially on dark days like these, I keep the curtains closed just to save some, some energy. Um, and so I open the curtain in front of the, of the back door and I'm face to face with a burglar. And this guy is just using a screwdriver to try to force the door open. And then he looks up, apparently he didn't hear me, and he, 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 he sh you know, he, he start, he's startled, and he, he, he sprints away, he runs away. And at that time, I was like, oh my goodness, what do I do? Where's my phone? And, you know, I'm still not used to this house, so I, I couldn't find my phone. So I ran outside to the front, you know, this, the, the church square is... Uh, is my house is, is uh, built next to the church, and there are some people standing outside because the funeral is just over, and the, so the casket is being bought, brought outside. A uh, little morbid detail, the funeral was for one of the previous uh, tenants here in the house. So it's a, a, a man who has been living here for, I think, 15 years, maybe even longer. And I had met him a few weeks ago, and he was already ill, but I, nobody expected him to, uh, to die that, that quickly. Uh, so I gave him a tour, showed him what we 
we, we had done with the house and we, we, we talked and I invited him, you know, in springtime to maybe come back and have a, a talk a little bit more. So he died and that, that was his funeral there. And then I, I asked some of the other people to, uh, uh, to call, to call the police and they came of course, but the, the thief was already gone. And, uh, and so that, that was a, that was a little bit of a weird situation. I've never had any burglars ever in my life. So police was also, well, you know, don't underestimate this. You may actually get some, this, this has, uh, to, for some people, this has a, a quite a bit of an impact. So don't hesitate to, to, uh, to reach out for help. If we can do anything, let us know. Uh, they were super kind, um, Later on, they send a, a detective, or I don't know, it's like an expert in, in traces. And this lady uh, uh, took, like, samples of uh, the markings that uh, were made with that device, because then apparently they can tell what, what kind of equipment this uh, burglar has used, and they can compare it with maybe other burglaries in the, in the area. Uh, because, actually, it was not the only door. The door that I saw him at was not the only door that he destroyed. In fact, the noise that I had heard upstairs was he had almost completely destroyed the other door of the, uh, the, the, near the kitchen. And, and, and it was just the, the, the it has a three point lock system and the, he had destroyed the lower two ones and only the upper one he couldn't get through. So that's why he was trying out the second door. So that door has to be completely replaced. Uh, the door in the middle of the living room also will have to be replaced because he, even though he didn't have much time for that, he did destroy the the lower lock. And uh, and then the, when the police was uh, looking around, they also told me the front door is also unsafe. Um, it's a it's a door. The door itself is like a oaken, like a very solid, heavy door, but it is um, in a kind of a plastic frame, which was very popular at the time. Uh, low maintenance, etc. But the frame itself is way too weak, so it's it's uh, it's a, a security risk. And none of the locks in the on the on the um, ground level were um, were approved um, and secure. So all that will have to be replaced. It's a, I thought I was done with this house, and <laughs> I was hope, I was hoping to go and see Ghostbusters, and all of a sudden I become like a burglar buster. Oh, man. Thankfully, I was able to sleep quite well. I've been looking into some cameras, and I know, of course, that they're going to fix the doors and get I get better locks and, and whatnot. And then the, the most ironic thing of, the, of everything is, you know, what? Uh, there is nothing that is of any interest to a thief here. Maybe people told me, but you have equipment. Yes, I, of course I have equipment, but all this equipment is years old. Like the camera I use is three years old. The microphone, I think that Cliff Ravenscraft uh, got me this microphone maybe 10 years ago. Um, the the Rodecaster, it's a device, yeah, sure, you can try to sell it, but it's very niche, so it's hard for a burglar to, to sell this thing. Plus, all the... Uh, mobile devices are, of course, uh, protected by by, by uh, passwords. And if you try out too many false passwords, it will completely lock or wipe the device. Plus, the Apple devices have uh, Find My iPhone. Uh, so the police said most of the time they just don't take mobile phones with them anymore because uh, so, sometimes also uh, phones have this security system where you try to uh, if if the owner knows that the device is stolen, it can it can actually take a, t a picture of the thief as well. So they don't take any risks. What usually they're looking for is not televisions, it's not electronics, it's just money and uh, and jewelry. So according to the police, most of the time they go straight to the bedroom where uh, apparently people keep their money and their uh, they a lot of people have a safe in their bedroom. So good tip if you have that. Don't put it in your bedroom. Put it in a place where they won't look for it. But certainly not in a bedroom. And then if they can't find any money, they, they may actually quickly try to open some of your drawers and whatnot, so it may create a mess. But usually they, they want to stay there as, as brief as possible because, of course, the longer they are in a house, uh, the more chances are that they will be uh, overrun, which is what happened because this guy apparently thought that I was in the church because he had heard the church bells and he knew that there was a funeral. 
And he was, so that's why he did this in the middle of the day. So I still haven't seen Ghostbusters. Because then, <laughs> the rest of the week, I've been busy arranging stuff and having people here, carpenters and whatnot, to look at the situation and uh, d- uh, give me a quote. And then I had to negotiate, or negotiate, I had to talk with the people from the parish. How are we going to do this? Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> There's always something. There's always a reason I, I can't... I can't really settle here in this house. However, in the evenings, I normally have some time to to watch movies or to watch TV. Um, so I do have some some uh, movie TV related things to talk about. First of all, Hawkeye. Hawkeye is the new Marvel series that premiered. It is a uh, uh, Christmas themed. Very surprisingly, the the trailer already kind of hinted at that, um, and. It, I have to say, uh, it, it, apparently it's not very successful. At least it got like 40% less viewers than Loki, for instance. But I'm not surprised because Hawkeye never was, you know, among the more popular members of the Avengers. Um, and for a while they were planning on giving him a, a theatrical movie. He was the only one from the original Avengers who'd, who hadn't had his own, you know, solo movie. Uh, not even Black Widow had to wait for a long time. But then uh, when this series was launched, uh, they were actually trying to make us believe that that was on purpose because there's such a there's such a wealth of things that we wanted to do with the character and his backstory is so complex and there was no way that a theatrical release would have done justice to this wonderful character. And I'm thinking, yeah, <laughs> sure, right. <laughs> now that is so clearly marketing speak. Just admit it, you didn't want to do a theatrical release because you were worried that nobody would want to watch a movie about Hawkeye. And so apparently a little bit of that, you know, effect uh, also trickled down to the TV show. So it doesn't get the ratings or or, or the numbers that they were hoping for. However, despite that, I am having a blast. I really like that series. And if you compare it to, you know, previous superhero TV shows, like think of The Flash or even Supergirl and that sort of stuff. This is so much better. This is really top-notch Marvel quality. Uh, It's fast-paced. Yeah, every once in a while I'm thinking the special effects look a little bit on the cheaper side, but that's obviously because the budget is probably smaller and they have not as much time as they usually have with uh, with re- theatrical releases but but it looks really great and i think the story is is great i'm i'm so enjoying this and i like it that they gave it this uh, kind of die hard christmas vibe there is something about this time of the year that uh I, especially if you if you if they put it in a kind of a new york christmas setting it evokes a lot of the Movies that we love, uh, or, or that I loved um, in the past, you know, all the, the well, Die Hard is an example, uh, Home Alone, all those movies, and and I think it's genius that they released it in December and then gave it this this Christmassy vibe, um, and I'm hoping that a lot of people will still discover this over time, maybe by word of mu- word of mouth. Uh, that's always the big risk with TV releases, even though we've seen amazing successes with the Game of Thrones and, uh, you know, the Mandalorian and, and, and series like that, it's a bit hit and miss. You never know in advance if a series is going to find its audience or not. So a lot of these bigger platforms like Netflix and Amazon Prime are gambling on the success of these franchises. And, and, and often more often than not, it doesn't catch on. And, and great series are just remain undiscovered. It's not that they're not good, but it's just that there's so much to see that a lot of people just will think, well, hey, it's on Netflix, so I can watch it in a few months from now. I don't. I'm, I still have a big back catalog. It's like video games, too. A lot of gamers uh, have the same problem. They buy newer games, and then they never get to play them because they have so many other games. And, and, and maybe the game that they want to play is not very popular at the time, and so you want to play games, especially if you're playing online with other people, you want to play games that have a large... Uh, crowd playing the same game because it's more fun if if your friends also play that game. Uh, so 
that's kind of the, the downside of the TV golden era that we're in. There's just so much good stuff that a lot of the excellent work that is done kind of falls by the wayside and gets canceled way too early. So I'm th I think what, what Disney is doing with these short series is very smart because if a series doesn't get the success that they hope for, it's not a big deal. It's, it's pretty standalone. If they, if they would end Loki, for instance, now, let's, let's imagine that it hadn't been uh, a success for them. I think it would be perfectly fine. You could still watch it without getting frustrated towards the end, like, oh, we never get to see how it ends. No, it's Marvel, so these stories are perpetual, you know. They will continue. They can always come up with new ways to, to continue the story. Um, but it's fine if you just watch a, a slice of that, you know, bigger adventure uh, of that particular superhero. So, and I think for Star Wars, it's the same thing. Uh, we, we're going to get to see the Book of Boba Fett very soon. A few trailers have been out. By the way, I, I'm not sure about you. You know that I'm a huge Star Wars fan. Um, but I was watching that trailer, the Boba Fett trailer, and I was thinking, yeah, well, it looks nice. But I did not have that, absolutely not that same excitement that I had for The Mandalorian and for all these other trailers that I've that I've uh, reacted to on, on YouTube. I was like, yeah. And I don't know why. I can't put my my finger on it. Like, what? why does this not get me more excited? After all, it's Boba Fett. It's Star Wars. And I, I don't know. Maybe it's just the trailer itself that didn't work. Maybe it, it's because of... Um, the actor who, who portrays Boba Fett is maybe not the most charismatic actor. I, I, I wasn't a big fan of, of uh, his portrayal in the prequels. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. It's, uh, we'll have to wait and see. But even if, you know, even if this, this Boba Fett series doesn't take off in the way The Mandalorian has, um, and let's not forget it doesn't have Baby Yoda, so... <laughs> That is a problem, too. Uh, it, or, you know, Grogu. Uh, even if it doesn't work as well as they think, they can still keep it in their catalog and say, hey, it's just a one-season thing, so we'll just move on and do something that works, that where people can relate a little bit more. So TV series nowadays are also give these bigger platforms ways to experiment without taking too much risk and without, you know, making these huge expensive commitments for multiple years. Now, with the uh, other series, for instance, The Witcher, um, it's kind of the same approach. That that series did phenomenally well, especially if you look at the overall production costs, which were kind of more on the modest side, um, but it was a huge success. So, of course, it was going to be a, a second season. Apparently, now they're talking about seven seasons in all, and uh, Henry Cavill has already... Uh, express his willingness to uh, to play the witcher for all seven seasons yeah of course what what do you expect it's a good it pays well that job and it you know it, he doesn't get to play superman anytime soon so yeah sure i I'd, I'd say the same um and then of course you've got the big gamble that amazon prime took with a number of big franchises like the lord of the rings that is a series that's the most expensive television series ever produced they really are hoping that it can be the next Game of Thrones, whatever that may be. I, I, I always have to giggle a little bit when I hear them say that because they, they, what they mean is we want the same success as we had with Game of Thrones. We don't want to have a copy of Game of Thrones, but we want to have the eyeballs. We want to have the financial success that that series brought them. Um, and I'm not sure if that always is the best approach. It's not definitely not uh, a guarantee that you will just by pumping money into something that that will also give you uh, the audience. It all depends, I think, on the story and on the quality of the makers. Um, so uh, they are they have high hopes for the Lord of the Rings series. The first season is already in post production right now, which is exciting. However, they're gonna only launch that next year towards the end of next year so they and i am glad for that because it will it means they will take their time to uh to make it really really good wheel of time is the other huge franchise that they have invested uh in and uh but it was kind of still lower profile than lord of the rings i think they paid so much more for the lord of the rings franchise to get the rights from the for from the tolkien estate than they had to pay for um for the wheel of time 
uh, rights. And uh, the production itself was already uh, was also a bit marred by the COVID crisis, of course. And I I saw some stories about it, and I just didn't know what to think. I I expected something along the lines of The Witcher in terms of production quality of production value. And you know, I'm I'm a fan of The Witcher. I really like that series. But I was also enjoying it because it shows that they were maximizing uh, their resources. You could you can tell that it is a television budget in a certain way, but they were telling a really good story with it, and and the cast is excellent, the writing is excellent, but you can still tell that it's not it's not like a movie. So I was thinking maybe Wheel of Time will be a bit like that, and it's very very hard to match the expectations of a huge fan base that is just in love with this series and and is was following all the preparations so you know critically and and they were of course also a bit uh fearful like oh, what if this flops what if what what if they mess this up that we will never get to see wheel of time on tv in our lifetime and i've now watched all episodes I'm recording this on a Thursday, so tomorrow is going to be episode five already. So we're going to be halfway through the series because there's only only eight episodes, which is not much. And I know that the uh, director had hoped for ten or had begged even for more episodes, but no, they only got budget for eight. And so the story is going um, at a breakneck speed, which is not at all like the books. The books are very slow. Um, and, and so that, too, could have been a hurdle um, in terms of, uh, you know, how, how do you, what do you leave out if you, if you have to do everything in so few episodes? But it is amazing. I am so blown away by what they did. And the story has huge uh, re- replay or rewatch um, qualities. So I've been watching the first episode multiple times and I keep watching it. It's so good. There is so much in it. And it's it's enjoyable also the second ta- time and the third time around. And that is that hardly ever happens with television series. I never went back and rewatched The Mandalorian uh, because, it, you know, it was good for what it was. But this series is, is something different, especially the fourth episode. I was like, oh, this is so much better than the book. <laughs> that's what I think. It's so much better than the book. It has much better pacing, much better dialogue. There's much more balance between the various characters. Um, it's modern storytelling. Of course, The Wheel of Time was written a long time ago. And so I think this is a, such a perfect way to bring the story a little bit more up to date in a certain way, make it modern in storytelling. At the same time, it, it preserves and even, I think, strengthens the themes in the original story. Yes, they do take some creative license and they change some of the characters and some of the story arcs. They leave out, of course, a lot. But I am so impressed by what they were able to do despite the condensed version of the story that they had to tell and and how good it is and how much of an impact. Like that fourth episode, at the end, I was like, like, wait, I should breathe. (laughs) This is so incredibly good. Um, so if you haven't started watching it yet, highly, highly recommend it. And now, let's move over to the Peculiar Bunch. <laughs> Catholics rock! Here at the Peculiar Bunch, we're always happy to tell you everything you always wanted to know about Catholics and their strange traditions, but you were afraid to ask. Catholics can be a peculiar bunch. No meat on Friday. No meat? What do they eat? Light bulbs? And today I want to talk a little bit more about uh, Christmas and Advent and and COVID (laughs) and the implications for Christmas. Man, you guys got more crazy rules than Blockbuster Video. So yesterday morning, I got a call from uh, one of my radio colleagues over at um, Dutch Radio. Um, And he called me because he wanted to do a story about a press release that uh, he had just received from the bishops, the Dutch bishops of the Netherlands. Well, Dutch 
end of the Netherlands, <laughs> uh, which uh, in which they stipulated that um, the church will actually follow the um, the prescriptions of our local government, uh, which has decided that because of the rapid spread, we have a huge new wave of COVID infections. It's never been actually this this bad, even at the beginning, so, and that's worrisome because you know more than eighty percent of the people in my country have been vaccinated. Um, but apparently this, this, you know, less than 20% of people that are, for whatever reason, don't want to be uh, vaccinated, it's, we're t- still talking about more than a million people. And that is apparently just what it takes for this virus to continue to infect people and to spread um, and, and also to reinfect some of the people that have been vaccinated. Although if you look at the actual hospital numbers, people that have been uh, vaccinated and still get reinfected with the virus or get infected despite being vaccinated. Um, it's a small percentage of the people in the hospitals and almost none of them end up in serious conditions. Whereas uh, uh, I think like the huge majority of the people that are now in intensive care um, are non-vaccinated people. So um, it, it, vaccines definitely work, but not every, you can't force people to to get their vaccine. And so uh, that is uh, challenging, of course, our entire country and our economy and, and also the churches. Because especially in, in churches, you have a lot of older people um, that you want to protect even more. Because if they get ill, my, if my parents, my parents are both older than 80. If they get COVID, they could be, it could be lethal. They could may not be able to survive. I've had COVID, <laughs> as, you, as you know. And I was completely floored by it. And it it, um, had a huge impact on my health. And I only now, a year later, only a year later, I'm finally feeling a little bit like my old self. It took a year from from my health, uh, from my life in a certain way. Um, So, and I was super healthy. I'm I'm pretty fit. I run marathons. And despite that, you know, COVID almost completely destroyed me for a year. So anyway, because of the current surge in infections and especially pressure that that puts on hospitals and on doctors and nurses, our government has now uh, stipulated that stores, non-essential stores, so not supermarkets, but all the other stores have to be closed. It's at five, no gatherings after five, no sport events. Um, I've joined a little runner's group. So even there, we, we can still run because it's outside. And uh, of course, it's easy to keep your distance when you're uh, a runner. But we still have to uh, do our training in, in groups of mac- a maximum of four. And then those little groups, we have one trainer and then all these mini groups, they still have to keep their, their distance. So with a little bit of effort, we can, we can still continue to, uh, to run. But all the other sports... Are, uh, are currently forbidden after five. And so the bishops came together and they decided, well, you know what? We have to be responsible here and uh, we should not allow uh, masses or any other types of church gatherings after five o'clock as well. Because the goal is, of course, to reduce the number of, 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 of contacts that people have during the day. And if you just take out a number of hours, so from five till when do people go to bed, that's like from five to ten, that's five hours less of chances of people to infect one another. So that's the, that's the thought process. And that by itself will hopefully be enough to 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 slow down the pace of the infections but of course that has huge consequences for for uh, the weekends a lot of parishes have saturday evening masses especially in my country where you have few priests so a number of parish churches are are always on saturday they don't even have a sunday mass um, but much worse christmas eve christmas eve of course is by definition an evening activity and so the bishops are well aware that with that by following kind of the the prescriptions of the government they're also for the second time canceling christmas eve which is still one of the most popular church activities of the year everybody was hoping for a normal christmas and i as i remember how in during the summertime when infections were very low and we seemed to be at the end of of the covid pandemic at least in the rich countries um, that we would be able to have a normal Christmas again. And now for the second time, it's 
it's we're back to where we were. So we'll ha- probably have to stream Christmas from from a few churches and people will have to watch Christmas Mass on TV, which of course is not going to be the same, um, will not have the same impact, will not reach the same amount of people that we normally do if we have just were able to open our churches. So that came as a huge shock to many. That is why he called me up and can I interview you? So we, we did a little radio interview about that, in which of course, well, you know me, I'm an optimist. <laughs> I always try to look at the uh, at the upside of things. So I was like, you know what? Hey, it, last year we were in the same situation. Back then we were struggling to make ends meet. We we had no experience. Now we're a year uh, more more experience, so we know how to do this, and we we can maybe even do it better than last year. And I I, I was telling uh, the reporter how last year we we were streaming from the church where. Uh, next door to where I lived back then, and that we had a wonderful mass with a beautiful choir and lots of candles, and it had so much atmosphere. I, 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 it was one of the most beautiful Christmas masses that I remember, and it was in the middle of COVID, and we had hundreds of people from all over the world who joined us, either live or afterwards, and were also able to experience that Christmas feeling uh, and, and celebrate Christmas liturgically through that video stream so in a way, for me, that was a huge win. That was a beautiful Christmas, despite the fact that it was so different. So I'm thinking, different is not always bad. It can also challenge you to come up with new ideas and to be creative and to be resourceful. And so I was like, literally, during the interview, I was thinking out loud, you know what, I, I would like to, you know, to do something as well, to, to make sure that I can stream Christmas um, and, and make it, I don't know, make people, a lot of people everywhere in the world are currently in lockdowns and difficult situations. Not everyone can go to church. Um, but what if we stream not just Christmas Mass, but what if we create a little bit more around it? Like, uh, for instance, I don't know, maybe I'll just cook a Christmas meal, but I'll just stream from my kitchen. And I'll have people uh, cook with me, you know. And, of course, I can't really share the food digitally. But it's still fun to hang out in, in someone's kitchen. And the reporter said, I would watch that. Uh, I mean, who wouldn't want to, to, uh, to take a look in uh, a priest's kitchen while he's cooking? Uh, sure, why not? And then, and then I was like, oh, yeah, you could start with that and do all the meal prep for, for Christmas and then you have mass. And then maybe you, you share some time, you eat together virtually in a certain way, or maybe you have a hot cup of chocolate and talk. This is stuff that we cannot do in real life because I cannot have hundreds of people in my kitchen, obviously, but I can do it digitally. And it, so you can also look at the upside that it will maybe help you to reach people that would never come to your church or have just a very consumerist experience, which is unfortunately one of the downsides of Christmas. Is a lot of people are just coming there for, you know, feelings. <laughs> they're not really there for the message. They're certainly not there because of a religious commitment, but they're just there because it's oh, nostalgia and nice songs and hum along. And there's nothing wrong with that, but, but it's not ideal either. So uh, one of the uh, things that I think we learned from streaming, and you know, I've been doing this for <laughs> how long now? I've been podcasting for for since since 2005 so for more than 15 years i've had the experience that that even though i am not face to face with you and i'm just you're just hearing me or if you're watching the live stream you're seeing me on youtube um, despite that i do believe that we have a real connection and that that sometimes the engagement uh is is much bigger because i can talk back I'm, i'm reading the chat now and i can answer the questions or react to suggestions um and that's something I, I can't do, even with all the time in the world. I always go after a mass in real life. I go and stand on the, you know, in the back of the church when it when the weather is bad, or even outside if it's dry. And I take as much time as I can to, to speak with to talk with people. Oh, for some reason, the lights go out here. <laughs> it gets very dark. Maybe the battery is empty. I'm gonna fix that during the next jingle. But anyway, so um, the. Uh, uh, the, the advantages of the engagement that you have with social media is uh, is a win for me. So 
try not to. And, and then I got some nasty reactions on social media, as always. Like people, it's a shame. Those bishops should be ashamed of themselves. It's a right to go to church. And I'm thinking, well, the bishops are just trying to do what they should do as shepherds. They're trying to protect their flock, protect them against this virus, protect people against infecting one another. It is the responsible thing to do. And the fact that you can't go to Christmas Eve Mass is not going to send you straight to hell. On the contrary, you know, it's a little sacrifice for the good of all. And, of course, you can always go to church on, on, on uh, Christmas morning. That's just as valid as if you go to Christmas Eve. So I'm always like, please, don't, don't fall into the trap of all that negative, you know, harsh language and judging the bishops for what they do. They are in a difficult situation. They're trying to do the responsible thing. Um, let's, let's not be too quick with criticizing other people. Let's just try to work together to help people uh, be safe and to be creative and resourceful to celebrate Christmas, even if we can't do it in the way that we're used to. When did you become an expert in thermonuclear astrophysics? Last night. The packet. The extraction theory papers. Am I the only one who did the reading? All right, I'm just opening a curtain here. <laughs> it's, it's getting really dark. It, uh, so I've got the lights here set up for actually for mass. So I was getting sick and tired of all the cables that were running through this this room. I mean, it's a big room, but still, ah, every device needs its own uh, power brick and cables and USB stuff, and it was all over the place. I was getting, and then I, I remembered that these these lights actually run on batteries, but apparently that one has a battery that's either faulty or maybe I forgot to charge it properly, but it, it just all of a sudden went out. And then, of course, this room gets very dark as I, I shut all the curtains um, because uh, I, um, you want to have maximum control over the light. The downside is I'm now, for the people that are watching this on YouTube, I'm like almost in the dark. Thankfully, I've got this little, little IKEA light here that almost looks like a, a candle. Wait, actually, it's like an oil lamp. I will put that in front of me. And I can actually turn up the, the it's, uh, oh, it's, it's actually already on maximum, but it, we'll just pretend that this is a little campfire and, and it's lighting me. <laughs> Makes it a, less, a little less dark. Oh, well, this is part of uh, what I've been doing over the past weeks. It's just uh, trying to get my act together when it comes to streaming. And it's much more uh, work than I thought it would be. Just getting this set working, this pod this is just a podcasting set, that took me days. Uh, and and I actually was able to put this in place after even weeks of experimentation. What is the best setup? How am I going to do this? Especially with the wiring and, and the, all the electronics that are involved. How can I keep it simple? I'm still working on the, on the Lego uh, studio next door here. That's also tricky. It's really... The camera setup. How am I, I? I need another computer there I, because you know you don't want to disconnect everything and then move it to another room and then move it back and forth. And then I have a third room from which I'm streaming, which is the um, the editing room. That's where I work on my TV shows. But I also created a little YouTube set so I can do like these uh, trailer reactions, for instance, um, and I can do that much quicker than than I used to. But well, then you get these surprises of, uh, yeah, oh, wait, if I run these lights from batteries, then maybe I should have a routine to charge them in time. But this is not the tech uh, segment of the show. This is the book segment. And wow, I'm on a race against the clock. I'm currently actually trying to win the challenge that I set myself at the beginning of this year. Last year, for the first time ever, I did a Goodreads challenge and I, I vowed to read 24 books, I think, something like that, 24, 25 books. And, and it was exhilarating to actually read that many books uh, in a year. And so, encouraged by the success of that and also how much I enjoyed reading again uh, as a child, I, I, I was reading so many books and then I, life got too busy or I made myself too busy. I didn't allow myself time to read. Um, but this reading challenge helped me to do that. And so I was so encouraged that for this year, I was like, I'm going to read a book every week. That should be feasible. And it, I, as long as I have this routine of taking an hour between 5 p.m. and 6 p.m., that's when I'm going to read books. 
I'm going to be fine. I can totally read. I, that means I, I, I can read about 100 pages per hour. I'm a fast reader. Um, so I could, you know, in theory, I could even read um, one of the Wheel of Time books every week. I would be done by the end of this year. Well, that is true if you're not moving, <laughs> if you're not renovating a house, if your life is not completely turned upside down by COVID and long COVID and everything else that happened this year. This has been one of the most hectic years of my life. And so I ended up with a challenge that was only halfway in the last month of the year. So I still have to read 24 books and the end of the year is going to be 29 days. I asked Google this morning, you know, how many days until until New Year's Eve? And it's like 29 days. Oh my goodness. That means that I have to read one book per day. You would say, that's impossible. I say, yeah, I'm going to do this. That is the challenge that I need. And so I am determined to read a book every single day day and i'm not cheating with like super short books of like 15 pages or something like that no real books it means 100 page, 100 plus pages um then that's of course still a, a short book but i'm kind of I, i'm more interested in what kind of books i read than um than the number of pages if i love a book i can read really really fast like currently i'm reading um uh, uh project hill mary from andy weir the writer of the martian and it, I wasn't a fan of the previous book, which I did a review uh, of in, in this podcast. Maybe if you uh, Google uh, or you look at the, on the website, fatheroderick.com, you'll, you'll maybe be able to, to, uh, to find that review. I really don't remember which episode it was. Um, but I wasn't very impressed. I felt a little bit forced. Um, this book, The Hill Mary Project, so far is amazing. It's really, it's got the vibe of The Martian, and um, it's super enjoyable. It's about 350 pages, I think, but I'm, I'm reading, I've been reading 20%. The other day I was starting, but I, it was a day on which I was very tired. I didn't sleep much. I have this, uh, one of the radiators in my bedroom is making this ticking noise, and I think it's because the pipes are running through holes in the wall that uh, one of the... Um, People that have been doing the renovation, they they used a kit to to close the gap around the pipes, and so when the pipes are getting hot, they start to expand, obviously, but they can't because they're trapped in those holes, and so that's making this ticking noise, and it's waking me up all the time during the night, and so I had one of those very bad nights. I was super tired, and so I tried to read it, and I just fell asleep while reading, and I couldn't keep my eyes open. That's the only downside of reading book book books in a chair. It's you put your body in a super, you know, relaxed mode, and and so I fall asleep. Uh, most of the books I I listen to them when I'm running. It's very hard to fall asleep while you're running, but because I've finished my marathon, I don't have these long runs anymore because I'm still in recovering in recovery mode. So. Um, so I do have to, uh, to put a great, a great effort into finishing these books. But it was really, uh, it was a good week. I, I did manage to read uh, one book uh, per day. If you follow me on Goodreads, by the way, you can also read my reviews. I force myself to write short reviews. And for me, it's, a, it's, a, it's more than just wanting to share my opinion. It's also uh, training myself to express my opinion, even if it's not what other people think. I've been brought up uh, in, a, in a sense that you would, al you, you would always think twice before you would say something that could maybe irritate other people. It's a, maybe a Chinese trait of my education. And so I've always been a bit holding back. Uh, and... and uh, the, the another downside, <laughs> I like a lot of things, so I'm not usually very disappointed in things that I read or or, or movies that I watch. But uh, but with these books, I, I'm forcing myself to write a short review because then not only do I have to voice my opinion, but it also forces me to think about why I was disappointed in a book or why I loved it and, and give some reasons. And so it helps me also to process the contents of the book. <laughs> so I wrote a scathing review <laughs> of a book that was... 
pretty popular uh, about 10 years ago. I think it's called uh, Things, the, 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 dot, 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 my dad says. And uh, it's about this uh, um, guy who, who moves in with his parents when he's 24 or something like that after a broken relationship. And then uh, his father is apparently just says anything that comes to his mind and is using lots of expl expletives in the way he says them. It's all very out there. And so he started tweeting the stuff that his, his dad says, and that Twitter account got massively popular. He got on all sorts of uh, late-night talk shows, and then he wrote a book based on all those tweets. And everywhere on Goodreads, like four or five stars, people are, it's so hilarious. And I was reading that, hoping to have a good time, because I like humorous books. I've read especially a number of autobiographies that are very, very funny. Um, and I was reading this book, and I was like, oh, my God. Goodness, I just can't believe the bad language. It's so vulgar and so unnecessary. And so I was like, uh, this morning I finished a book, and I was like, ugh, no. I'm, I'm just going to give this two stars. It's the lowest rating I've given any book on my reading list. But then I was like, but the majority of the people that have read this book do like it and love it. So I had to formulate why I think that this book didn't work for me. And it's not just because I'm a priest and there's bad language. I would say I'm a European, so we're actually much less prude when it comes to language than, than most of my American friends. I'm not sure if that's a quality, but it's a fact. We, we're much used, much more used to expletives and, and, and kind of like swear, swear words uh, here in Europe. Uh, we don't raise an eyebrow when someone uses, uh, let's say, the shorter words in our vocabulary. But in the United States, it's like, oh, you said the X, Y, Z word. And like there's almost this taboo on certain words. And and so maybe it's the shock value of the book that, that, that people found it hilarious because this guy just dares to speak his mind and use words that we don't dare to use. What are other people going to think? I was just like, golly, just stop it, man. Just can you say, can you not use those words? It's it's annoying. It's not funny at all. There's no shock value in it. It's just dumb. I just didn't like it. But anyway, uh, if you go through my reviews, you will see that there are books that I love and there are books that I'm like, huh, no. And, and there's a bit of everything. I was just looking at my list the other day. I was like, it's, this is so eclectic. It's so much me. I am like... Just like in the kitchen, I eat everything. I try out so many different recipes. It is crazy. There is no theme in my life. Look at this YouTube channel. What is the theme of this YouTube channel? There is no theme. It's me. It's this just this explosion of interests and uh, this podcast. What is it about? I cannot explain it after 15 years. I don't know. It's just this podcast is me. And so it's all over the place. Uh, if you don't like that, there are other podcasts that you can spend your time on. <laughs> anyway, so um, here's my pledge. I'm going to make the end of my challenge. 24 books to read, 29 days to go. The scientifically wonderful world of science. What sort of science? Welcome back, science friends. I recently was studying the science of dreams. That was so fascinating. It's a book uh, that, that reminded me a bit of another book that I, uh, another scientific book that I really appreciated reading, and that's uh, Why We Sleep. You heard me talk about that book uh, uh, at length in previous episodes. So this book was called Why We Dream, and it, it said on the cover that it would be like a s neuroscientific approach to dreams and why we dream and like the re latest research. Uh, so I had high hopes. I thought it would really be like Why We Sleep, which gave me so much insight in my own sleeping patterns and behavior and how to improve things. But this was much more focused on, on dreams and especially on a fascination of the author. Uh, she, she talks a lot about lucid dreaming and about techniques on how to, um, how to make that happen. Lucid dreaming basically is something where people are become aware while they are dreaming that they are dreaming. And because they have this awareness, they're kind of awake in a dream, a bit like uh, Inception. You remember that movie? That's kind of for, for for fans of lucid dreaming. That is a huge movie because it, it it's what they're trying to achieve to be awake, but at the same time they don't have the inhibitions that real life has on them, so they can basically steer their dreams. Um, 
So the book uh, has some scientific stuff in it, which is interesting. And it made me think about the function of dreams. I'm a big dreamer. I dream a lot. Uh, I'll get to that later. But, um, uh, but, but it also has a number of chapters where she just goes to meet all these other lucid dreamers on kind of vague esoteric conventions. And it just goes on and on and on. There's no critical approach to to the conversations that she has and it's such a letdown it's like come on you could probably condense this book down to a third of its length and and if you just keep the science it would be a very very uh re big recommend of me but with all the kind of the wonky stuff in it i was like yeah i don't know sure i read it because i'm fascinated by the topic because i i dream a lot literally it's one of the things that my friends father henry father michelle father harry always tell me after uh our summer vacation like you dream all the time and it's true like every morning i have something to tell them like ah oh, the other night i had this crazy dream and then i i tell them the dream and they're like what really uh, father henry is like i never dream and then, or uh, uh, maybe I dream, but it's really not interesting. And you have all these like big movie kind of dreams where it's like super exciting and the weirdest things happen. And then I noticed like, when when I was reading this book, it's like you know what, this is interesting. One of the one of the scientific aspects uh, that the book uh, uh, underscores, and that was new to me, is is kind of the 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 importance of dreams. So apparently, if you prevent rats from dreaming, that is going to kill them in the long run. Um, so dreaming is not just something weird that your mind does. No, it's a very important function uh, of, of your brain to process what happens and also to prepare you for what's coming. And that, if you, if you look at dreams from that more therapeutic uh, angle, it kind of makes sense that we dream. If we are um, dreading something that's going to happen may happen in the future if you dream in advance you know about a worst case scenario then then that helps you get ready for maybe what will happen in real life and and sometimes maybe the fact that we often have these weird dreams um where you you can wonder you know is, is why the symbolism because oftentimes the things in it you dream are not literal but they are like symbolic representations of, of what you're preoccupied with, maybe it's also a way in which our brain is trying to kind of trick us into processing stuff that we normally wouldn't want to deal with, even in our dreams. Also, it's very critical, the book is very critical towards all the dream theories of Freud, Sigmund Freud, and, uh, and his uh, pupils and Jung and all that stuff, because it's so outdated and it is, it's not scientific. That was a very interesting read. Um, so a lot of the early dream researchers had just hunches, but they didn't have even the, the scientific uh, capability to verify their claims and their theories. So modern dream re research is much more, it's like one of the disciplines of, of, of psychology. Um, it's, it's more rigorous and I think more careful in, in when it comes to interpreting dreams. One of the things that was interesting and, 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 and a takeaway from the book was that she uh, encourages the people that want to uh, investigate their dreams a little bit more and, and try to understand themselves through their dreams to keep a dreaming journal. And she explains also how that neurologically works. You know, uh, It's very hard to remember your dreams if, you, if there is time between the dream and you actually getting up. And the more you distract yourself, for instance, like if you hit the snooze button, that time that you're no longer dreaming, you're in this light sleep, that will actually erase the dream because part of the brain is non-functional. And for a good reason, you don't want to have all these inhibitions in your dreams because dreams are meant to actually help you through experiences that normally in day-to-day in -day life you would block because they're too scary, too, I don't know, hurtful maybe. And so dreams kind of um, are, are, are usually not uh, meant to be recorded or you know they, do, they don't go into your long-term memory. However, you can actually, if you wake up right after a dream, and, and, and the moment you wake up and you remember the dream vividly, and that can just be a matter of seconds, you know, if you then record your dream, that is where you get a lot of insight in what's actually going on in your subconscious mind. And so I've been trying to do that. 
the other week. And it's it's been pretty amazing. So I've noticed, like this morning, I woke up and I vividly remember that I dreamt something. And I was like, okay, I need to write this down. And so I take my, but then I'm thinking, I'm so tired. You know what? I uh, Just a few more minutes. And I noticed that my dream was starting to fade already. I, I was aware in a certain way. I was not aware in the dream, but I was aware while sleeping that, oh, wait a minute, I'm starting to lose my dream. So I forced myself to grab my, uh, my iPad and in, um, uh, I'm using uh, day one, which is my, my journaling app. Um, I created a special category for dreams. For, it's my dream journal. This actually may be the last straw for me, or the last push to get a subscription to day one, because uh, I have the free version, which only works on this iPad. And the iPad is a bit of a heavy device. It's a 12.9 inch iPad with a keyboard cover. So it weighs more than a kilo. It's very heavy. And it's not the most, not the easiest device to operate when you just wake up. So, you know, I'm thinking, what if I can have uh, day one on multiple devices, and I could just pick up my phone and do like a short voice recorder recording, which actually would be much better than trying to type like sitting half right, half upright in my bed. But anyway, the fact that I've been like the moment I remember the dream and this morning I had to really force like, I, it's on the tip of my tongue. What did I dream? What did I dream? And all of a sudden I was like, ah, I remember what I dreamt. So this is what I wrote in my dream journal this morning. I dreamt that I was working with the broadcasting company that I work for on a project for next year. I needed people to help light a situation that I wanted to film. So it's all about the lighting. Of course, I'm busy with light lighting here in, in, the, in my studio as well. Um, I was assigned a group of young people who had been working on the website of the broadcasting company before. They had no experience in with lighting, but they wanted to help. Of course, that's probably because of this young journalist that interviewed me yesterday and I was like wow this guy is like 24 I'm I'm twice his age <laughs> that's such a weird some weird moments where you feel so old uh, but I was also very impressed by uh, by by just the quality of his his work so here I was very surprised at their ability to make a, a plan for the lights uh, because they had no previous uh, experience. And then it was followed, but with lots of negotiations with the broadcasting company. They didn't want to pay for the lights. And there was a lot, of course, this reflects all the negotiations that I've had over the past few weeks uh, where, you know, yeah, I'm not going to make my TV show anymore. They do want to keep me involved, and but the, it's all up in the air. They have no idea what that, how, the, you know, what I can do next year. So I'll probably have to come up with ideas as well. And so it's this whole negotiation that enters my dream here. So it's probably something that I'm very pre preoccupied with. Like, what should I do? I'm, I'm just like my dreams. In my dreams, I'm rehearsing the options. I'm rehearsing the the, the situation to come. And so, uh, and then the the group of young people, they they were. I think I was trying to light the church here next door for for the for the streams. And they told me that they would make a plan and they would come back in a week or so and, and show me. I don't even remember writing this down. So, and then the, so the first question in my dream journal is, what did you dream about? Describe the dream. Then how did, it, did you feel during the dream? And here I felt, I remember that I felt very helpless to negotiate a real project. Um, and in, in a way I was cheering myself up, like, look, I get the help from all these young people. And at the same time, I'm like, yeah, but this is, these, 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 these people have no experience. You know, it's, uh, I, I deserve better than just to get a people, a group of non-experienced people to help me kind of in their spare time. Uh, this is not serious. I felt a little bit on the wayside. Um, then the next question is, what did you, what do you think triggered the dream? I just explained why I think this dream was triggered. And then what do you think the dream means? So there's a trigger, and then it's meaning. I think it's my anxiety for my work the next year. Uh, fear to be without a budget, uh, without concrete plans, without people that can help. Uh, getting leftover crumbs in, in, instead of a real contract. Uh, that's my fear. 
And in my dream, I'm kind of preparing myself for the situation. And then the last question is, of course, kind of uh, could lead potentially to you having more influence on your dreams. The question is, how could you have influenced the story of the dream? So what if you were actually lucid, aware that you were dreaming? How could you have impacted the events in that dream? That is also problem solving, a problem solving question, which, you know, apparently this is something that you're struggling with. What can you do about it? And so I wrote down, I could have stepped in with a plan. I could have negotiated harder. I could have uh, walked away and refused to work without a proper budget, uh, etc. So I could have been much more assertive, which I wasn't in my dream. I was just like, um, yeah, thank you, but uh, I don't dare to say it, but I, 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 I really hope for something better than this situation. So anyway. I've been writing down three or four dreams now, and now that I'm reading them back, they're much less impactful as when I dreamt them. But it is, it's a fascinating process, and I'm definitely going to continue this, this dream journal. I just have to kind of make it easier. Um, and so I'm thinking of creating, uh, in one way or another, like a, I need to have an app where I can just push one button on a, uh, maybe even on the lock screen, and just do a voice recording. So just the, the steps of, uh, unlocking my iPad, launching the app, and I still, you know, I, I'm sleepy, so I launch OneNote, and I'm thinking, ah, not OneNote, uh, day one. So my mind apparently gets confused with the the, the, the words, one, day one, OneNote, sounds the same. Uh, but then those steps are already part of the erasing, uh, they help er erase the dream, the memory of the dream. So I need something that is like super fast. Maybe I should just put the, the H2 Zoom recorder next to my bed and just uh, record that and, and then put it in a podcast feed. <laughs> we are on the cutting edge of technology. Wow. Well, what does that mean? Let's plug it in. It's going to say, hey, I see you plugged in a new device and it's going to load in the appropriate drivers. You'll notice that this scanner built... Whoa. Well... Audio technology stuff, it just ends in disaster. But there is one more thing. So uh, I was almost tempted during um, the Black Friday sales to get um, to get another um, reader, uh, e-reader. So I've been using the the Kindle Paperwhite, which is my second Kindle. So I had the the, the earliest one. I bought it in the United States during one of the CNMCs, which was a, a media conference that we organized more than 10 years ago. Um, and Amazon was not in the Netherlands. So the only place where you could get an Amazon Kindle was, well, while I was in the United States. I remember buying one of those early paper whites, or they weren't even called paper whites, it's just Kindle. No no backlight or anything. So I used that for a couple of years. Then I, I switched to the paper white uh, because it's affordable, it's cheap. But um, uh, now that I get older and I, I have trouble with small screens, it's just, of course, I can make the letters bigger, but that also makes for a worse reading situation because you have to t turn the pages so often. So uh, I was talking with John Domic the other, the other day and he showed me his, um, his Kindle, the, the slightly larger Kindle with the, the physical buttons on the side, which also has a slightly bigger screen. So that looked nice. These are usually quite expensive. So it was discounted uh, during uh, the, the Black Friday sales. So I was like, should I get one of those? And then I'm thinking, no. One of the devices I like to read on the most is actually my iPad 12.9. Because of the screen size, it makes it easy, much easier for me to read, to have a reading experience that is like reading a real book. I could just, it, it, there's a lot of text per page, it's clear, and I don't have to turn the page every second, especially if you're a fast reader, having to like constantly click the screen to, to turn the page, it's, ah, so annoying. Um... But the downside of the iPad 12.9 is how heavy it is because I use it also basically as my laptop or like a secondary laptop. So I keep the keyboard case on. It's a Log Logitech keyboard case and it just the entire thing is super heavy. And so normally I don't mind because I always put it in a laptop position. Um, but for reading, it's it's uncomfortable. And even though I can use a like a pillow, for instance, to prop it up a little bit, after a while it gets really uh, heavy. 
And so I'm looking into getting an, an e-reader with a bigger screen, and those are pretty rare. Um, but I found one that actually looks interesting. It's the Kobo Ellipsa. Kobo is a Canadian brand, and they are very popular and very good at also at creating e-readers. Um, it's not linked to um, the Kindle... Uh, what is it, uh, the, the, the Kindle world, so you can't really read your Kindle books on it uh, because it's a closed DRM-regulated system. They do have their own Kobo store, but you can also read EPUBs. Plus, there are also um, uh, apps that you can use to strip the Kindle books from its DRM, so I'm thinking I could probably also just get the, the books that I have on my Kindle and port them through USB to my computer and then uh, uh, transfer them to a uh, format that, that the Kobo can read. So I'm, and, and what is uh, interesting about the Kobo Ellipsa, that's the name of the, of the I think it's a 10.9 inch screen. You can also write on it. Of course, it's not as fast as a, and first style as a, 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 an iPad or a tablet, but it does a decent job, and I'm thinking, you know, that is actually something I could I could see the usefulness of that. If as I, le- I read also a lot of nonfiction, and oftentimes I was like, oh, I should underline this, I should rem- remember this, um, but I don't have the discipline to just. Uh, you can do that on a Kindle. You select text, and then, but it's slow and it's cumbersome, and on a little screen like that, it's a hassle. So I never do that. But uh, but if I can just scribble on a book. And, and I can keep those notes. Yeah, that's how I studied all my life. Um, so, and I know that, that interacting with the written text, I would never do that in a real book because I'm, I don't know, I have too much respect for physical pages. But in a digital book, I wouldn't mind just scribbling and, and, and uh, underscoring um, texts. I think it could, uh, could help with processing the books that I read so but uh, it, it, it didn't get discounted at all and it's a pretty expensive device like 399 euros so yeah maybe if I can find a good discount one of these months I'll switch over but uh, I'm, I, I'm, ac- I'm very happy that there is an e-reader with a bigger screen that is a ton lighter I think it's like 380 grams uh, that's that's only a third of the of the weight of an iPad so yeah I'll, uh, I'll let you know what I do. And with that, I think it's high time to wrap things up. This has been a long show, but there was just so much I wanted to share with you. I hope you don't mind. Thank you so much for uh, joining me today for my podcast, my um, Patreon fans. Uh, I've got another episode of Father Roderick to the Max coming up soon, in which I will talk about uh, running in the rain, about beetroot stew. Yeah, sounds awful, but it's actually quite tasty. I'll uh, let you know what I learned this week on TikTok and on other platforms. We'll talk about baptisms and mass, superheroes, and I will give you a review of a a nice game, a Japanese game that I've been playing uh, the other day called Craftopia. It's kind of a mix between a crafting game and a survival game. It's a lot of fun. So, uh, and of course, I'll give you my uh, usual weekly overview of what's happening in my professional life and about the projects that are in the pipeline also for you, my audience. For uh, that and more, go to patreon.com slash fatherroderick. Thanks for listening and see you next week. And that's a wrap. Sorry for the the light situation. Does this work with a little uh, oil lamp? (laughs) It's the only thing I could... uh, come up with i don't know i did charge all those batteries and these two are still working fine that one just went out for some reason oh well i'll uh, i think i'll just recharge all the three batteries uh later today so and always start with fresh batteries never take it for granted that there's still juice in a battery because it's a battery but it definitely it's a lot easier uh to handle those lights with batteries than, than when they're all having their individual uh, wire Ugh. electronics. <laughs> Let me go to the chat room here and see what you've been talking about while I was talking. Oh, lots of reactions to the dream segment. Why I'm not surprised, because we all have dreams. Uh, let's see, Poland. 
Oof. There's a lot of chatter here. Okay. Star Trek. A new expansion for Star Wars. The Old Republic. Coffee. Am I going to do an updated house tour? So, yeah. So, uh, the reason that I, I'm hesitant putting the house tour uh, publicly on, on YouTube is because of the burglary. Uh, I jo just don't want to give people ideas. Um, I'm in the Netherlands at least kind of a, a more or less a public figure so people know where I live um, and you don't want to give burglars a, like a, a tour like come and see <laughs> here's what you get well maybe maybe I could maybe they would conclude that there's not much of interest here but yeah it's just the idea but I think I can do that for the Patreon audience SL7 is playing EVE online I've never got into, gotten into that game it's a bit daunting, so so many rules to learn. Uh, any more trailer reaction videos coming? Yeah, hopefully. It's it. I have still a lot of days where I am very low energy, and when I'm just tired, um, my reactions also become a little bit tired. So. <laughs> uh, Looks like a stoner for life. Says looks like a cool father to hang hang with and go fishing. Much love from down under in Australia. Oh, good to see you. <laughs> I'd love to come over to Australia and fish with you. That would be fun. Zegovia is greetings from Mexico. Muy bien. The mass lighting was awesome. Very atmospheric. Oh, good. Hmm. Five snowflakes, snowflakes in uh, in DC the other day. <laughs> uh. Can't chat in a car going to get my coffee after hearing Father talk about it. Still listening though. Oh, I should be sponsored by a coffee company. <laughs> a night in IKEA sounds like insanely fun. I, I think it was probably insanely fun. It's probably an, an experience you will never forget. <laughs> Uh, Diana is uh, popping in from Fort Worth in Texas. Good. It's 9 o'clock there. That's uh, central time, right? Uh, right now here it's uh, a little past 5 p.m. That's why I actually start my streams relatively late, like past 3 p.m. my time, so I know that at least half of the United States is able to, if they want, to uh, to join me live. I'm not sure about Australia. <laughs> hey, Google. What time is it in Sydney? The time in Sydney NSW, Australia, is 3.04 a.m. on Friday. Oh, it's like in the middle of the night. Wow. Okay, so, yeah, no Australians probably here other than uh, Stone for Life. <laughs> uh... SL7 stayed in a police station during a hurricane. Wow. Oh, that, that sounds like a movie script. <laughs> oh, people reacting to the burglary. Yeah, it was all in broad daylight. Yeah, middle of the day. I mean, that maybe in a certain way, I would kind of prefer that. If you'd try to, to break in during the night, it would have been much more scary, I think. Uh, <clears throat> There are two things priests are known to have in large amounts. It's cash and jewelry. Yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> Next time, just ring the doorbell. I'll help you. I'll help you. I'll, I will help you look <laughs> for, for money. Uh, Hawkeye episode three is awesome. Good, 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 good. The burglar busters of the Netherlands. <laughs> Fans are blown away. Good balance of action and comedy. I guess you're talking about Ghostbusters. Good to invest in materials to, to secure the house now, though. Or maybe get a certificate and let a company do it. Yeah, we're definitely going to uh, make sure that it is done properly. 
It's not Christmas until Hans Gruber falls from the tower. <laughs> yeah, such a shame that that um, Dumbledore had to fall from fall from the tower instead of Snape. It would have been a nice analogy. <laughs> the Book of Boba Fett. Oh, hope it's going to be good. Should Boba Fett be charismatic, though? He's kind of a villain. Yeah, I mean, with char charismatic, I mean, just engaging, appealing. It was kind of like the villain you'd lo you, you love to hate, right? Boba Fett was just cool. And now that he's no longer wearing the mask all the time, there's a lot of the coolness that just went away. I think that that's kind of the problem of uh, Django Fett um, in the prequels. It's like, you take away the mask, you take away the mystery. Wyvern, or Weavern, hello. Ali says, I missed a lot. Thankfully, you can always go back and rewind once the show is done. I wonder if there will be a top tier for the most surprises in the series. I'm not sure what series you're talking about. Uh, Monica is talking about Genesis 15. Atrocities, forefathers. Okay. <laughs> uh, Taro says, Oh, Father, I've seen your first time in Poland during World Youth Days. I stayed on the channel for the movie reviews. Well, that's great. That's, I think, where a lot of my Polish fans come from. It's from those vlogs that I did during World Youth Day. But I, I appreciate their tenacity to stay, to stay subscribed because that's like, how many years ago? Like five, six years ago. The idea of curfew as a public health measure kind of confuses me. It's a virus, not a vampire. Yeah, it's just like redu reducing the number of hours that people get out. You know, people like to go to Ikea just for fun. Fun shopping is a big thing in the Netherlands, and, and th there are a lot of people getting infect infected while they're shopping. And it's a shopping season, so uh, it kind of makes sense to me. Uh, and no, I, th I think if... Th I heard that same comment, like, if, if you don't do the evening masses, people will come to... And then the, the morning masses will be full of people. That's not the case with Christmas. Christmas Eve... You know, you get hundreds and hundreds of people that go to church only on Christmas Eve. They will not come back the next day. Uh, I'm just glad customers aren't screaming in my face, accusing me of hoarding toilet paper and hand sanitizer in the back of the store. Yeah, <laughs> crazy. A Christmas meal stream sounds fun, says Arika. I think it will be fun. I, I'll have to think about it. Fortunately, it's still a few weeks to kind of um, prepare for this. And I'm, I'm a bit unsure about the timing and whether, you know... Something tells me to keep it simple. Because simple is easy and manageable. If you try to do too much, I'm a perfectionist. It can also be a trap. that You, you kind of overdo it, and then I'm going to be completely drained at the end of Christmas Eve. Um, we'll think of something. H.R. Wilk says, uh, the, oh, the choir, Margo says, last Christmas was incredible. Yeah. If they are not already elsewhere, I'm maybe if, if we can use the church for it, then I could ask them if they could sing again. Again, it's complicating things quite a bit. Uh, we'll see. H.R. Wilk, I'm up for Christmas somewhere online. It looks like the pandemic... Uh, means I won't see my family again this year. It's good to have something to look forward to that can't be cancelled. That's true. That's one of the reasons that I wanted to do this. Give people something to look forward to instead of just dreading, ah, oh, it's going to be another failed Christmas. Last year I set up a video conference for my family on Whereby. It was quite fun to sit around with a lot of family and chat and have a drink and some nibbles. Yeah, I can totally see that. Maybe that's something we should do even with, you know, apart from Christmas. Uh, I, I could totally see, uh, for instance, like a board game evening and stream that and just hanging out with people. And it's like what I like to do with, with gaming. And, and at 
I've been concerned uh, for a long time that, you know, if I do all these things on the same YouTube channel, it's just going to confuse the algorithm and everybody tells me to be focused. And I'm thinking, you know what, that's not the point of my YouTube channel. This is about community. And uh, so why not? Why not just put it the same? I created this Lego channel so I could focus on Lego on one channel and not, you know, mess up the algorithm of the general YouTube channel. I'm still not certain that that was a good idea. I don't know. Um, there's something comforting about a live stream. That's true. It's just connecting. It's it's community. Arika says, the lighting is cozy. Yeah, it feels cozy. It also gives me a cramp in my neck because I'm leaning forward to catch the light of this, <laughs> this light. <laughs> we can also experience this as a bit of solidarity with Christians who can't be together due to religious persecution. That's true, too. Uh, Goodreads says that you are on 40 of 64 books of my challenge. That's true. So 24 books to go. That's a lot. <laughs> uh, the more you put into your spiritual practice, the more you will get out of it. Europeans and Americans are equally as vulgar in different parts of the country. Is that true? The people that I know from the U.S. are very prude when it comes to language. Like, I couldn't even say the S word, which is so common here that I don't... I, I, during my first visits of the United States, I didn't even realize that I was saying that. I was like, oh, man, that's so sh... And then they were like, oh, don't say that. There are kids here. <laughs> what? What did I say? Oh. Oh, is that a thing? And then they had these, these abbreviations like, oh, that's the F word and the S word and the N word. And the, I was like... What? <laughs> okay. Uh, and, and then, of course, uh, all the swearing is bleeped out on, at, not on cable, but on regular television. So that's something they'd never do here either. If you watch uh, Gordon Ramsay, there are no bleeps in that. But in the US, they do that all the time. So And then they, you have even like the, the movie ratings. It depends on the number of times you say the F word and stuff like that. It's like, wow, that that is... Oh, it's a country of, 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 how would you say that? What, what always puzzles me as a European is that the United States as a country is so full of contradictory things. Like it can be very, uh, uh, very sensitive to bad language uh, and, and, and nudity and stuff. And at the same time, it's the country where you walk in a store, buy a gun, and then your son goes on a shooting spree. You know, it's the stuff like that. As if for us as Europeans, it's so. It's. I'm not saying that we are saints or anything, but it's. It's sometimes so weird that these, these extremes are are part of the same culture. It it often doesn't make sense. Um, but anyway, it's and humor is the same thing. You know, it's like. Uh, uh, some series that do really, really well in, in the U.S. I'm watching, like, sitcoms. An example, Friends. I hope, Hopefully I'm not uh, offending you, but I've been really trying hard to get into Friends and, and discover why that was so massively popular and people thought it was so outrageously funny. And I've been struggling to get through these episodes. I think it's so boring and so not funny. Ah. Frasier. Why is that funny? But then, on the other hand, you've got The Office, where I'm, like, constantly, like, choking, so, uh, because I'm laughing so hard. Same country, same culture, same genre, and, there, and, 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 and The Big Bang Theory and The Office, I think it's the best comedy I've ever seen, Parks and Recreations, and then you have Friends and Frasier and... Uh, What's that other thing with the bar? Seinfeld. Uh, and I'm watching that. And I'm thinking, I don't get it. I don't I don't see why this is... Fu this is not funny to me. It's just... The jokes are lame. And, and it's also tame and slow and boring. And nah. What is that? I just cannot understand it. It's probably me. <laughs> um...
Margot says, I'm, I'm in the line of work where colorful vocabulary is the norm and I barely notice uh, a rogue F-bomb. <laughs> here, here, even kids in the, in the schoolyard will, will yell that at one another. They don't even know what it means. <laughs> uh. Mostly only bothers me when people swear on purpose to be edgy. Yeah, that's kind of the idea that I got from the stuff that my dad says. Alice 7, I used to fly in my dreams, little matrix action. Yeah, that's um, sometimes I, I do that too in my dreams. I can fly or I'm sitting on an airplane. That that uh, Sometimes I'm just sitting on the wings of an airplane. That's pretty cool. It's like a James Bond type of thing. And that was always suspect in in, in the times that, that Freud was still very respected. And uh, he, he would say, everything you dream is sexual innuendo. It's all about, you know, repressed feelings and stuff and then and then this book uh that i read and that i discussed in the show um says that that's completely rubbish that is there's no scientific uh, uh proof for that it's just a theory that he had and even his own pupils like jung already thought it was was nonsense uh, but but for a lot of people in the kind of general uh, awareness that people still think that that is all like something you shouldn't talk about it's suspect if you fly in your dreams and well, apparently it's not because it's also um, it's 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 a very good indication that in your dreams there are certain logical uh, reasoning that is um, that is not functioning in your dreams, and there's actually an evolutionary reason for that because the dreams are meant for you to try out stuff that in real life would be impossible, so you can prepare for real life. So it, it makes sense to me that theory. Margo says, I will sometimes dream I'm about to do something deadly like drive, driving off a cliff and realize I'm dreaming and can just wake up. Uh, that's kind of a little bit of a lucid moment in your dream. Sleep paralysis. That is something that we all have, of course. Hmm. Black Razor. Schönen guten Abend, Vater. <laughs> From Austria. Herzlich willkommen. Callum says, I've just presented a presentation for a university after staying up all night working on it. This is the kind of chilled content I need to take the edge of and wind down. <laughs> I'm glad to be of service. <laughs> I'm winding down also. It's the end of the day and I'm starting to, you know, I was planning on uh, recording uh, Father Roderick to the max, but I'm going to take a break after this. <laughs> yeah, Callum probably needs some sleep now. I couldn't do that. I, I've recently had three nights, three weeks in a row, where during I worked almost all night long to meet a deadline for the TV work, and I was like, you know what? I'm so done with this. This is very, very bad for my health. And it uh, usually derails me for almost a week if I do that. So, gosh. For that, I'm so glad that the TV work is at least not continuing in the same way as it was for the previous years. It's just it's a ton of work. Ah. <sighs> Erica says, my dreams are just a lot of unrelated nonsense. Yeah, that's what it seems. But apparently, that's not that's almost never the case. There's always a rhyme and reason to it. That is why it's good to sometimes reflect upon your dreams and, and maybe you'll, you'll figure out. It's like a puzzle. Your mind is not random, actually. Even though it may seem random. Remote viewing while still awake. I've never heard of that. The light gives it more of a hobbit feeling. That's that's true. <laughs> you should think about an alarm. Yeah. Uh, someone recommended the Ring cameras, which is Amazon. Uh, my house is more Google, um, but the Google alarm cameras, uh, they don't have an alarm, actually. You can't um, turn on a siren. 
And apparently, it's even though the cameras are good, it's not as reliable as the Ring system. Sometimes it will not detect anything. So, eh. I wish that Google is great, but they very often drop the ball on stuff that they produce, and they never really. It's like their Pixel phones. They're great, but they're not good enough. It's a shame because if it works, it's really nice. Put some dogs in the rooms when filming the house. Yeah. <laughs> here's my other room with my German Shepherd. And here's the kitchen. And there's my Rottweiler. <laughs> Alex is from the Philippines. Welcome. <laughs> I like the idea of board gaming. Maybe it was something like t Tabletop Simulator. Yeah, I've, you know what? I've, I have that game. And I have no one to play it with. So <laughs> maybe you can stack the light on a book. Yeah, it's all kind of tied with the wires and they go under the desk and I can't really move around much. Oh, the Australian counselors had to be careful with language. That's true. In Australia, they're also... They, they like to swear quite a bit. <laughs> Maybe Friends is just because it's old as a show. I don't know. <coughs> also, there's so many characters in that show, and it's pretty kind of slow. It's, it's, it feels very formulaic. And doesn't Friends have a laugh track, which they don't have with The Office? And I think it makes all the difference. What about Big Bang Theory? Big Bang Theory has a live audience. So it's not a laugh track. So that's good. Um, hey, Star Wars Theology. He's uh, working on a YouTube channel about Star Wars Theology. <laughs> I think you, you emailed me to see if you can uh, do an interview. And I, I wish I could uh, be of service, but for the next couple of weeks, it's still so, I'm so kind of <laughs> overworked with all the stuff that still needs to be done. So my mind is not really in a place where I can, I can do that yet. But uh, stay in touch. Uh, Eruano can't stand the office and has watched Friends dozens of times. Really? Wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the American logic. I'm not the only one who uh, <laughs> who has trouble understanding. Finally, someone else who doesn't like Friends. Seinfeld. I tried Seinfeld. My my brother was a fan of Seinfeld, and I I it was on Netflix or still is. And I watched a few episodes. I was like, yeah, I don't know. <clears throat> ah, sleep or paralysis is when you are mentally awake but your body is still mobilized. Ah, okay. The US version of The Office is slightly better than the UK version. Really? Uh, it's like a ton better. This like the UK office is oh. No. It's too much cringe. It's like everybody is horrible in that series. Um, maybe, maybe not. I, the, the romantic uh, part, well, even that doesn't really work for me. Um, no, the American Office. I mean, it's so, so amazing. I'm, I'm currently rewatching the Office because I'm reading a book uh, on on the making of the Office, and it makes it so uh, rewarding to rewatch some of my favorite episodes. <clears throat> Derek Young says, I'm watching you on TV and I would suggest taping off that illuminated Apple logo because it's distracting. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. It's true. I think the newer Apples don't have that uh, lit Apple, right? The, the, is that true? The, the new MacBooks don't have that anymore? It's just because I'm using 10-year-old stuff. Please tell the burglars in my in my neighborhood. I, I have old stuff. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I, 
I'm very excited for Spielberg's West Side Story. Oh my gosh. My favorite musical of all time. Oh, I can't wait to see it. <laughs> Frasier is hilarious to me, says Stephen. I couldn't get into it, but I only watched one episode. What's your favorite actor? Uh, there are so many good actors. It's impossible to choose. Um, hmm. I don't think I've ever experienced sleep paralysis, but it does does sound uh, does sound a little bit scary. Just like stories of people being trapped in their brain while they're in a coma, and they can still hear all the doctors and family members and around them, but they are just locked up. They can't react. Yeah, that's scary. Uh, yeah. So Star Wars theology. Um, yeah, it's gonna it's gonna be a while. Uh, right now, I'm, I'm I'm trying not to do too much uh, because my life has been busier than ever. So even thinking of planning something for the near future is probably not going to be happening. I need to be kind of like this. My life needs to wind down a little bit to have room for um, for all the all the extra stuff. I, right now, I'd like to focus on on just getting my life back in, in order and, and to do my things. Even podcasting is still a, quite a challenge for me to, uh, to get that on the, on, on the road again. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is now 5.30. I need to go to the kitchen and prepare myself some dinner, but it was really nice to hang out with you. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, if you want to listen to my other podcasts, take a look at fatherroderick.com. We'll talk soon. See you later. And thanks for all the feedback and all the ideas. Always a joy. Bye. <laughs>